After the first two episodes of the new season of Doctor Who, which seemed determined to greet any potential new Disney viewers with everything that could be fun, camp and just plain ridiculous about the show, all of a sudden the third episode comes along and it takes a much, much darker tone. It can only mean one thing, Stephen Moffat is back baby! For this third instalment of what is the new season one, we have an alien planet, murderous AI and the Doctor trying to stop a war while standing motionless in one spot for the entire episode. So let's take a look. Doctor stuck in one place, this really becomes a strong episode for new companion Ruby Sunday to try and get him out of this fix. Although you would have thought that the Doctor would have learned his lesson the last time he stood in a landmine. Yes, he has done this before, believe it or not. We're in the middle of a minefield. Follow me and tread my footsteps. Twelve seconds later. Harry, I'm standing on a landmine. <laughs> With Gatwin largely immobile, Millie Gibson's Ruby Sunday stepped up as the Doctor's eyes and ears, giving us a chance to see her take some serious risks. It's definitely Gibson's strongest performance so far. It's a great building of the relationship between the Doctor and his new companion. She isn't going to blindly obey his orders. She's going to do what she thinks is right, even if that means putting herself in danger. This episode is full of fantastic lines, but perhaps Ruby gets the best line of the entire episode, as she responds to the Doctor saying, Ruby, I forbid this, with a character defining, yeah, good luck with that. And our new Doctor showed off his emotional side, serenading us with a haunting soldier's song instead of trying to sarcasm his way out of this pickle, like perhaps Peter Capaldi's or John Pertwee's or Christopher Eccleston's version of the Doctor would have tried to do. It did also feel like a lot of the classic episodes that were filmed in an old quarry somewhere in Wales. It was definitely a change in tone, one that I think might very well surprise the new American audience. I mean, Come on, in episode 1 we had goofy talking babies and snot monsters in space. In episode 2 we had the Beatles, a super camp villain and plenty of singing and dancing. In episode 3 the Doctor steps on a landmine and Ruby gets fucking shot whilst the message of thoughts and prayers keeps dotted about as if that's somehow comforting. <sighs> Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. It jumped up a notch. It did, didn't it? The reoccurring theme of orphans reared its head again, with Splice, Ruby and the Doctor all having that same thing in common by the end. Episodes that rely on a child actor can fall or stand on that performance, and uh, unfortunately there was a moment where I thought that Splice was actually supposed to be another robotic AI program, one that had been created by her father. She did seem to be completely oblivious to the fact that there was a landmine nearby and her dad was now dead and now a holographic image. And Splice seemed to be far too old to be distracted by photographs of holidays that she and her dad have been on. It's not a knock on the actress, absolutely not, but I do feel that perhaps a younger person should have played this part. If you're going to write the part like this, maybe a younger person should have played it. Oh, and uh, how irresponsible were these soldiers anyway? How was it that she was able to just go wandering out into the battlefield without being stopped or without any sort of adult supervision? I mean, come on. Throughout the story, Moffat is pulling out elements from his previous scripts. For example, the villain guard were first mentioned in his very first stories for Doctor Who, The Empty Child and The Doctor Dancers. Indeed, the way that Splice kept asking, where is my daddy? was spookily reminiscent of the empty child saying over and over again, are you my mummy? The militarised clerics are a returning faction from the time of angels and the time of the doctor and Moffat bringing them back for this story was a brilliant idea as it's allowed for the doctor to make a point about the blind faith we put in technology and the peculiar moments when we suddenly decide that we need proof rather than belief. This was also a message on the stupidity of war and the profitability of it, because there's always someone out there 
that's making money out of all this senseless fighting. The villain guard had ensured that as long as the war kept going, the more that the spending would continue. As it turns out, there is no opposing side in this war. There is no sinister species hiding in the mud or in the fog. And the Marines have spent all this time fighting against their own tech, fighting against an algorithm. Indeed, the ongoing message of thoughts and prayers whenever someone dies in this pointless war really hits hard. As in the United States, recent victims of gun violence have also been offered thoughts and prayers by seemingly sympathetic politicians who then refuse to do anything to legislate gun ownership or enact safety measures to prevent this sort of thing from happening again. But all these messages felt natural to the story. They were embedded into the storytelling without them being too blatant, too obvious or even too patronising, which has been a criticism of recent Doctor Who stories. Amongst the fog of war there is a blooming love story going on and the will they, won't they romance between Mundy and Canterbury kept the plot moving along nicely. And it was a genuinely upsetting moment when it soon dawned upon us that this romance was a doomed one. And hang on, sorry, was that Varadu Seifu as Mundy? As in next season's already confirmed companion, Varadu Seifu? Again, there's always a twist in the end. Speaking of a twist, the real star of the piece was the AI villain itself. A terrifying extrapolation of current tech that decides whether you economically deserve to live. Tales of killer robots have been done before on Doctor Who, of course. For example, the Cybermen are literally a political take on the fear of technology replacing people and society. But here, they are some truly creepy philosophical undertones. And it's yet another appearance for Susan Twist, this time as the interface of the AI ambulance. She has now appeared as five seemingly completely different characters across six episodes. Mrs. Meridew in Wild Blue Yonder, the heckler in the church on Ruby Road, the communications officer in Space Babies, the tea lady in The Devil's Cord, and now the AI ambulance in Boom. Surely the Doctor is going to start noticing something soon. Is this leading somewhere or are the production team just having fun with us? I really hope it's leading to something. By the way, uh, I am aware that I haven't reviewed last year's Christmas special, The Church on Ruby Road, or the trilogy of 60th anniversary specials that brought back David Tennant and Catherine Tate and introduced Shooty Gatwa to the series. Now, my review of Space Babies and The Devil's Cord seemed to be quite popular, hence the reason why I am covering Boom as well. Uh, but would you like me to go back and review these previous episodes as well? Let me know in the comments section below. In the end, it was a father's love for his child that trumped the AI's cold calculations in a resolution more deftly managed than Moffat's previous stab at a similar theme with James Corden. And this episode also has the benefit and bonus of not having James Corden in it. And the Doctor even got to name drop his own parental experiences, continuing this season's trail of long lost relative breadcrumbs. Again, are we going to see Susan Foreman at some point? All in all, a taunt, unnerving episode that somehow still found time for those little heartwarming moments. It felt like a good healthy mix between classic Who and new Who and is easily the best episode of this series yet. Probably one of the best episodes in a long time. Leave it to Moffat to make standing still for 40 minutes an exercise in nail-biting suspense. Oh, where was this energy during the Jodie Whittaker era? Why couldn't we have had Stephen Moffat write at least one story for Jodie Whittaker? Hopefully Moffat will be sticking around more often. Uh, I hear that he's going to be doing this year's Christmas special, so fingers crossed for that. And it does look to be setting things up for Monday crossing paths with the Doctor again, as he promises that he will soon come back to visit Splice and Monday this time for some fish fingers and custard, one of the dishes a post-regeneration Matt Smith demanded from a young Amy Pond in the 11th hour. Mmm, delicious I'm sure. In conclusion, again, this is the best episode of the season so far. If the double bill opener put you off from watching this season of Doctor Who, and uh, honestly, I wouldn't blame you, then do come back and watch this. Give the series another go. I really, really hope that the increase of quality in these episodes continues. 
Speaking of which, next time, well, 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 we're back in Wales. There's going to be some folk horror, a pub, and possibly Susan Twist again. But in the meantime, if you have enjoyed this video, then please take the time to leave a like and a comment. Please also consider sharing this video across your social media, in particular with anything related to Doctor Who and classic sci-fi in general. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so yet, and do activate the notification bell to stay updated on new uploads. But for now, thank you very much for stopping by the Big Daddy D Reviews channel, and we'll catch you again next time.